conferences. This is our 16th uh, weekly conference altogether. And uh, we moved uh, from Friday to Wednesday to accommodate people's uh, summer schedules. And so thank you to everyone who's able to spend the afternoon with us today. Uh, we have a really exciting lineup. Uh, we're going to be talking about back to camp and working with COVID-19. And just in the few minutes discussing uh, as, as our panel was arriving, uh, it's evident that this is a topic that's near and dear to everyone's heart. If, if you don't have a child in school, uh, you may be in school yourself or have a neighbor or another family member uh, in, affected. Uh, so getting back to campus is, um, is just a microcosm of what we're all going through with getting back to some new state of normalcy uh, during the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic, the contours of the pandemic have changed a lot, even in the last 10 days. Uh, John Halam, could you want us to, uh, can you give us a few comments from, from your church? Well, absolutely. And so folks know that as a Mayo Clinic employee, I have situational awareness of Minnesota, Arizona, and Florida. And so, of course, what you've seen exactly as you described, Arizona in particular is hit quite hard. And you're starting to see ICUs completely fill up and staff, you know, running ragged, you know, in a sense, it's like New York just shifted a few months in the future. Uh, Florida, a little less so. Uh, yesterday, Mayo Clinic went live with its hospital at home program, where especially those who are highly vulnerable to COVID, we're moving acute care into non-traditional settings with remote patient monitoring, in-home nursing, supply chain, paramedics, and telehealth visits. So you keep these people out of contact <laughs> with anyone who might have COVID. And, you know, if I were to, since every week of XPS, you know, trends, Right. So what we're seeing here, it's not so much the second wave. It's just this heterogeneous distribution where now we're seeing some of these states, especially in the South, see very significant expansion. So we're asking how to react to that. And the answer is remote care, contact tracing, the usual social distancing and protective measures. And then as we still think about what's coming next, you know, continue to work on expanding capacity for cures especially around convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulin. And MITRE, of course, very involved in all that activity as we ask, how do we expand and scale that to thousands and thousands of donors and recipients? And so uh, MITRE and the coalition are exploring revenue sources, collaboration sources, ways to get public awareness and physician education on convalescent plasma even better than it is now. And so, as you say, what a wonderful theme we're talking today, because everything in the next few months is still going to be very tenuous. And we've talked about back to work, but how do we go back to school? And what are the technologies and tools and best practices we need? And I can tell you from a Mayo perspective, our senior management does not plan to meet in person until at least after Labor Day. And I see the openings of schools and I think, hmm, if I'm not allowed in the executive suite till after Labor Day, bringing a bunch of 20 year olds together in a room doesn't sound so great. <laughs> so love to hear the conversation. Thanks everybody for joining and FX back to you. Good, thank you. And uh, Jay Schnitzer, can you uh, bring us up to date a little on the coalition evolution? Um, I, very briefly, uh, John and I have been uh, going around to the work groups, uh, working groups and members and asking the question as the coalition evolves with COVID into the next phase, what, what should it look like? What should these activities look like? Remember that the coalition was never intended to be permanent. It was stood up to be something temporary and stopgap and and to respond rapidly and inject solutions on a short time scale, days, weeks, and at most a, a few months. We're now approaching three and a half going on four months of age, which is no longer the same time scale as we talked about at the beginning. So I think it's very reasonable to be thinking about the next steps. Um, the other, and uh, we, we would invite input from all the members as to what that could look like going forward. The other thing I would add to John's comments about schools, and particularly we're talking about colleges and universities, but it includes schools from uh, preschool all the way up. And there are different issues with different age groups, as we all understand, given the 
differences in epidemiology of this disease uh, in different uh, ages and the impact, but equally importantly, thinking about residential colleges and universities, we want to make sure that dormitories in the fall don't become the next cruise ships or meatpacking plants or nursing homes in terms of being petri dishes for COVID. Uh, and that's a real risk. And I have not, in talking with experts over the past few months, I have not gotten a satisfactory answer from my perspective as to why that's a perfectly safe and okay thing to do in September. So I think we've, uh, we, as this coalition as experts, owe it to the broader community of this country to be thinking hard about that problem. And just as John said, if his C-suite execs aren't gonna be meeting face to face in a very protected environment, why is having several thousand 20 somethings or even a little bit younger on a campus in crowded dormitory conditions any better. So back over to you FX and thanks for setting this one up. Thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, to the uh, work groups that have contributed to this today. Uh, I wanna particularly thank uh, Andreas Tuck and team for their work. We're gonna be hearing from um, uh, many voices today. Uh, we'll have uh, three uh, brief presentations uh, from uh, Wesley Wildman, David Berker, and Gordon Long. Uh, so let's go right ahead and get started and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for our, our discussion that will be led by Andreas. Uh, so Wesley, go ahead. And uh, if the speakers- We actually start with David. Oh, sure, David. And uh, I'll, I'll let the speakers uh, kind of introduce themselves and bring us up to date on, on their perspectives uh, through the pandemic. Sure. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and my pleasure to be here. Thanks for including me. Um, uh, my name is David Broker. Uh, I work at Purdue University. Uh, my day job used to be uh, the Chief Innovation and Collaboration Officer for the Purdue Research Foundation. Um, and in that role, I had wonderful opportunity to work with outside companies and try to bring technologies into the university and uh, the reverse of that, try to take technologies and research out of the university. So being on that sort of boundary area and, and uh, trying to solve big problems is, is really what my sort of um, uh, life has been. Uh, and there's no bigger problem, obviously, than COVID. So about four, three months ago now, um, President Daniels um, commissioned a safe campus team. Uh, it was mostly academic folks. Um, and they came up and, and again, think about the, the, co is the interesting thing about COVID is things change every two to three weeks. And I tell people, you know, as we develop our plans for reopening, uh, we are gonna, you know, go through probably six or eight planning cycles. And we're probably five out of eight right now. We've, we've probably got a couple more to go before, you know, the, the onslaught of all students come back to campus. So, you know, still a very flexible and dynamic plan. And to me, that's one of the key lessons is, if you think you've got, you know, one plan in place, you're probably uh, not prepared uh, and you've got to be responsive and flexible. But but uh, coming out of that March timeframe, uh, President Daniels uh, wanted to set up an implementation team. Uh, so he asked me to, to chair that group or lead that group. So I'm responsible now for coordinating several, uh, about six or eight cross-functional integrated interdependent teams. Uh, we've broken ourselves into, you know, the core activities uh, uh, of the university, uh, research operations, which we've been trying to bring online over the course of the summer, because that's when most of the research faculty um, and graduate students do their work, and now residential life, uh, and, and as well as uh, learning and instruction. So those are sort of the core activities. And then they're supported by a different group of uh, support teams, everything from safe buildings and infrastructure to health monitoring and surveillance, uh, HR, uh, communications. Uh, and so those groups meet uh, every multiple times every week, trying to develop the overall integrated plan for the university. Um, it, as I mentioned, things are very fluid, very dynamic uh, in the world of COVID, I think, as we all know. Uh, and what's interesting is how do you bring this group of 20-somethings, it was hinted at uh, already, you know, it, it's really two diverse populations coming together. Um, one in their 20s, uh, relatively immune or seem, seem to think they're immune to the disease to, uh, and juxtapose that to, you know, a group that's highly vulnerable um, due to age and, and potential risk factors. 
And so our whole strategy has really been built on a couple things. One is we have to protect that, that most vulnerable group. Uh, we've got to do everything we can uh, if we want to create a classroom uh, and campus environment. Uh, so understanding who those people are, what kinds of risk mitigation factors come into play to protect them, um, uh, how as 20-somethings uh, you have to change your behaviors. That's not always easy. Uh, but we've rolled out what was called the Protect Purdue Pledge, which begins to articulate what some of those behavioral uh, aspirations and expectations are down to the point of everything from wearing masks to uh, practicing, you know, good safe distancing, uh, uh, the, the reporting of symptoms and doing uh, daily symptom monitoring, all of the things that we know are going to need to be done in order to bring these two populations together. Um, uh, just today, a uh, very, very dynamic situation. Um, we we were, uh, didn't want to test everybody coming back to campus. We didn't think that that was uh, you know, necessarily a value adding uh, exercise when we set our plans about two and a half, three months ago. Uh, we wanted to apply most of our testing uh, capabilities and strategies uh, to when all cam when the you know, campus came, uh, you know, uh, arrived and, and we focus on surveillance and, and active monitoring. But given the recent uh, situation in the last two weeks, really, and the pandemic uh, spreading in different parts of the country now, looking at uh, high infection rates, uh, you know, Purdue is a... Um, it's, it's essentially a microcosm of the United States uh, with a heavy dose as well of international populations. Half of our undergraduates come from Indiana, but 40% come from uh, states like California, Texas, Arizona, Florida, uh, as well as a heavy dose of uh, um, international travel students. So, you know, think of 30,000, 35,000 people arriving on campus uh, in, you know, middle of August. We've got one month to go. Um, and given all of that dynamic, so we literally made the decision over the last several days, it was announced today to test everyone um, uh, coming onto campus. And it, that's just, again, a reflection of um, what we need to do uh, in this world of COVID. We need to come up with you know, an adaptable plan. Uh, it's gotta be practical, scalable, implementable. Uh, we looked at a lot of things early on but if it didn't meet those criteria, we knew we couldn't do it. We couldn't implement it in time. So um, we uh, are, feel good about where we are, um, but every day w you wake up challenging yourself, you know, are we doing the right thing? Do we have everything in place? And, and now it really is about thinking about what some of these contingencies could be if things get worse. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and, and look forward to questions uh, during the discussion. Thank you, David. Uh, the reason why we started with, with David is that uh, we definitely wanted to give you the the voice of the practitioner to who really has to deal with it as a first uh, um, opening remark on this. Um, the second part, uh, I'll ask uh, Gordon Long to give a, a presentation about uh, who are the Jasons. And the reason why I invited him in particular for this meeting is only last uh, Friday, they published a report, which is, in my opinion, a great compendium of uh, scientific insights that all are influencing uh, when we are talking about going back to campus and coping with COVID. And uh, we originally wanted to say back to campus, but we realized very, very quickly that Dr. Dave just uh, very well uh, discussed as well, namely, it's not going to go away. Just, we are looking into something which is likely to, to stay with us for a couple of more semesters than we originally uh, expected. So Gordon, if you can give us uh, an overview of uh, the report and its main ideas, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna see if I can share the screen. Let me know if people can see it. Looks good to me. You can see it. Okay. Um, Cool. All right, so I'm Gordon Long. I am from the MITRE Corporation. I'm the director of the JSON Program Office. And uh, for those of you who don't know what JSON is, I can give a brief overview of it. It's JSON is a collection of, of select scientists. It's a group that form an advisory group that advises the federal government on matters of national security. But they're all, by and large, 
uh, university professors, academics in the sciences, dominated by physics, but um, uh, actually started almost 100% physics and now is much more diverse in terms of academic disciplines, although still dominated by, by physics. And so most of the studies that we do are related to national security and defense or intelligence or uh, uh, things of that nature. But because the Jasons are all university scientists, and just including uh, infectious disease uh, specialists and biologists and people of that nature, uh, they took it upon themselves. This is a non-sponsored voluntary effort to come up with uh, something that they were all personally facing, which is how do we restart university research programs? So um, let me go to the to the next slide. So they. Um, Gordon, can you go to presentation mode as we you, see if your screen, but not your... Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's better. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah, so uh, that's sort of your one picture of Jason or somebody's idea of what Jason was. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a picture of, uh, of the physics building at MIT to kind of illustrate that this is or get across the point that these are research universities that the focus of this report was. So it was, uh, it was not so much focused on bringing students back to campus as it was bringing or restarting research programs at major universities, kind of Harvard, MIT, Stanford, those type of universities. And many of the Jasons are on the research, on the restart committees at those universities. So it was something that they were all facing and they decided to come together to kind of pool their resources and, and come up with some recommendations and ideas on how you, how you restart. Now, given the fact that this is research, uh, you could ask, and it's a legitimate question, how much does that apply to undergraduates and, and graduate students? And the answer is some of it, you kind of have to decide for, for yourselves. You can look at the report. I think a lot of it does apply more broadly, but that wasn't necessarily the focus of the report. Um, I should also say that even though I'm the director of the program, I was not personally involved in writing the report. So this is other people's work that I'm talking about. So the questions that they asked were geared towards questions that an administrator at a, at a research institution might have, such as <clears throat> what are the relevant characteristics of COVID-19 that I have to worry about in terms of restarting my, uh, my research program? Um, you know, what are the timelines? What are the, the, the things that, that really are relevant about the, uh, <clears throat> the characteristics of, of COVID that, that apply? Uh, what's the risk of airborne transmission? Um, how do I reduce that risk? Uh, physical distancing, masks, so it, it talks about this. Um, the modifications to the HVAC system, uh, reducing droplet generation, aerosol generation activities, uh, discussion about occupants of the room, questions like that. Um, <clears throat> what's the role of testing? Uh, what kinds of tests are there? It talks about the, the RNA tests, like the, uh, the RT-PCR tests, the LAMP tests, antigen testing, the serological tests. What roles do those have to play in diagnosis, in screening, in monitoring? Uh, and there's depending on what you use testing for, different tests may apply differently uh, for those different uses. And, and things like monitoring, for example, you have to worry very uh, closely about false alarm rates, you know, false positives and false negatives, because those could completely uh, uh, swamp the signal. Background could completely swamp the signal, for example. And there's, there's discussions about that. <clears throat> um, uh, discussion about health screening, what type of screening do you do, what are the different uh, impacts if you did different types of screening, uh, discussion of super spreaders, uh, this concept of can the campus act as an island from the rest of the community and to what degree will it interact with the rest of the community and what effect will that have on the infection rate within the campus. Um, operational policies, uh, certain recommendations it makes for research groups and for uh, you know research administrators. So that's what the report is really about. Uh, I'm not gonna. I don't have time to go through the whole report. I can just kind of give you some examples of of the kinds of things that it does. 
So one of the things it does is distill a lot of research that's been, that has been conducted into something that is relevant for this question. So this is an example of the timeline. Um, <clears throat> and at what tells you when is the infectious period, uh, when will you get positive tests for, you know, the PCR tests, uh, for antigen tests, antibody tests, uh, what do you really have to worry about? And of course, one of the things you most have to worry about is the pre-symptomatic period between uh, when somebody becomes infectious and when they start to develop symptoms. So a lot of the policies are kind of geared towards that, uh, you know, with, with, with that as an underlying uh, relevant piece of data. <clears throat> In terms of modeling, uh, I know that uh, we're here to some degree to talk about modeling. The, the modeling in the, in the JSON report is not uh, sophisticated computer modeling. It's more simple differential equations like this. This is just an example of uh, HVAC uh, questions such as how many air changes are necessary. If I do more air changes, how much is that better than fewer air changes? And by the way, what's the uh, effect on the probability of infection? <clears throat> So you come up with a kind of a simple model here with a concentration of the room and a, and a source term of, in terms of virus generation and a sink term in terms of the half-life of, the, of the, uh, the virus in the aerosol and terms that talk about the effect of the air changes per hour, you know, the, the room ventilation. And using these simple equations, you can come up with some, some rule of thumb answers to uh, things like air changes in, in HVAC. So that's the kind of modeling that's done. It's, it's not sophisticated computer modeling, it's more some simple, simple differential equations. Um, and these are uh, just some other smattering of topics. I think I talked about these earlier, the types of testing. Uh, so I don't have time necessarily to go into detail for the full report, but it is available. It is unlimited distribution, and uh, uh, you can ask me any questions about it in the question and answer period. So back to you, Andreas, thank you. Thank you, Gordon. So what we have learned is that there's definitely a, a big need, and uh, there is a lot of information that is available. Um, I'm always uh, amused when Gordon says it's nothing complex, it's just a, a simple differential equation and then he shows me something which I learned at the end of my uh, first mathematical connections when I was going for my bachelor. So it's uh, fortunately with the PhD a lot of this became a little bit easier, but mainly because now I have students that can do this for me. Um, so how do we make this applicable? And uh, before I give it to uh, to Wes, um, when we met yesterday, I realized that I very, very often assume way too much of people as I'm a systems engineer and I think everybody is uh, thinking as a systems engineer and knows what I'm talking about immediately. Um, so what we tried to do within the modeling and simulation working group of the coalition is we tried to get the requirements from people like David and the science from people like Gordon and now make it applicable to someone who has a problem to solve. In our example, as the administrator of the school. So the very first things that we have to understand is that we are dealing with a complex problem. Complexity means that uh, you have a lot of different parts that are all interrelated, that are all playing with each other, and they are interrelated in nonlinear fashion. So even if you have a very small change in one component, it can have a significant big impact somewhere else. And very often it's not what we actually intended. And uh, so in addition, we have this idea of emergence that uh, there are attributes that are not connected with the uh, elements that we originally put into the system, but that are emerging from the way that these systems are playing with each other and are interacting with each other. The problem is that the human brain is uh, more connected to think in a linear fashion and in a direct feedback fashion. And that is not the problem that we currently have. 
In addition, we have what is called deep uncertainty. Deep uncertainty can be best summarized with nobody knows exactly what's going on. And if you have five experts in the room, you come out with eight opinions. So is it really true that you only can get infected if you are being in the same room with someone with COVID for at least five minutes? Or is it true that you can get COVID when you pass somebody in the park and nobody of you wears a mask? There are a lot of ideas out there, but the science is not yet so far that we can with absolute certainty exclude everything. So we are learning more and more and more, and the more we learn, the less deep uncertain area we have, but there are still a lot of those. Can data analytics help us? Um, data analytics can help us that we can collect as many data as possible, can apply data analytics to um, recognize certain trends and then project these trends into the future. But that only works if we are not changing the constraints. So if we are looking into something which happens right now and we are applying what we see as a trend, we are assuming that what we are changing is not going to change the constraints of what we want to influence. Obviously, that is nonsense. It's not what we want to accomplish. So we need to do something else. We need to capture the ideas as Gordon discussed them and capture them in a computable form. And that is when we are starting to think about modeling and simulation and using the simulation to implement the knowledge uh, that they have been presented in the form of formula and interconnections to show if I introduce effect A, I can observe effect B. And even if I am in a complex environment, I still have a good connection and an overview of what's happening. In particular, I can have a lot of different facets of the problem and bring them all into this one system. And then I can run the system. And if my assumptions uh, that are now explicitly formulated as a mathematical formula are correct, I may see some additional side effects that I did not expect. Like when we are uh, originally started to really make everything to save every life possible. And by doing so, did cut back the selective surgeries. And as a side effect, several of the small hospitals started to go bankrupt because they didn't have the income anymore. Nobody wanted anything of this to happen, but we were just thinking on this one particular aspect. So modern simulation helps you to at least be aware of what's happening around you. And in particular, if you are using so-called agents or artificial societies. Um, agents are nothing else but little digital representation of acting entities that can plan together, that can exchange information, that observe their artificial environment. And if you use these entities to, for example, come up with a society that is representing your object of interest, then you can start to have a very guided evaluation and analysis of what you're interested in. And this is exactly what we did with the working group. We decided that back to campus would be a very good way to build an artificial society of a university that now can be used to test several ideas and to evaluate several ideas. And what we did and how we did it will be given in a mini overview by uh, Wesley who was leading this effort. And uh, the interesting thing of this is, this was done by the human simulation group. Only a third of the human simulation group are engineers and computer scientists. The majority are people who are doing social science, who are doing human behavior representation, who are understanding how the human mind works. And uh, I learned a lot in this, and so I now shut up and let Wesley take over and uh, give us an overview. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, thank you, FX2. Nice to be back with you. Last time I was here, we were speaking about the beginnings of this project, and we have uh, good results now, as well as an open source tool that's ready to be shared with universities. 
I'm a philosopher, one of these humanists that Andreas is talking about, but I'm in the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences at Boston University. And I also am an executive director of the Center for Mind and Culture, which is uh, the, um, one of the key collaborators in the human simulation group. The thing about human simulation, as Andreas has been talking about it, is that there are a lot of very real human problems that affect standard epidemiology. And you can have a look at those factors. In this model, we look at the things in blue and in orange and in green, not so much the hospital related things in black. But the, the, in university context, this translates into real problems. If you're in a school where 10% of the revenue comes from football, moreover, a ton of revenue subsequent to that in terms of people donating to the endowment and whatnot depends on sports, it's very difficult for you financially to imagine shutting down football. And if you're in a school that's hypersensitive about privacy, it's difficult to have the centralized kind of contact tracing that allows the university to know where people are at various times, or to use the hardware devices that are currently being talked about in the chat. These human factors really matter, and they're not usually taken account of in epidemiological models. And that's why the Human Simulation Group has tried to develop an artificial university that is sensitive to those very important human realities. So the decision support tool that we're calling the artificial university can be configured to match those sorts of realities. The artificial university can be made to match in terms of population, activities, gyms, dining halls, all of that kind of thing, but also what's politically feasible as a policy. Universities have tough choices to make there. They just can't do everything and they can't, there's some things they just can't do at all. And universities also have different values. They care about different sorts of ways of determining what counts as success. Sitting behind it all is the agent-based epidemiological model and the social networks that Andreas was just talking about. And that permits us to have a virtual experimental platform where we can calibrate and optimize and run sensitivity experiments. Well, what I'm going to show you is just a few results that I promised the last time I was here so that you can get a sense for the sorts of things you can do with this tool. It's an open source tool, of course, so that means it can be adapted by anyone with the right kinds of skills. And um, that means that it's super flexible, but we do have an interface that's coming within a week or two, which will allow schools that don't have those sorts of skills to be able to use it straight up as it is. Oh, one standard question is what policies maximize the number of people never infected? And what we see here is the artificial university tells us, which is reassuring in a way because everyone else is saying the same thing, that high compliance with physical distancing recommendations is the thing that matters most. The second most important thing is centrally monitoring contact tracing. This is the intrusive kind of contact tracing where you know in, in the cent some central place in the university, what the contact tracing apps are saying. Uh, those two things together explain 83% of the variance in health outcomes. You can also do something very important, boosting the testing for student facing staff. So these are the people who clean student areas or who meet with students for long periods of time. So we know quite a bit, uh, change the metric, some of those orderings change and so on. Uh, that's very important to remember what you're trying to measure produces different results. Now let's have a look at uh, hybrid class structure. What that first graph says in ordinary English is that eventually the same number of people are gonna be infected. You really can't change the number of people who are never gonna be infected by doing hybrid classes. What the second graph says is that you can slow the spread and essentially flatten the curve. And that's a critical consideration for universities that wanna have separate buildings for quarantining infected students. You've got a limited resource just like a hospital emergency room, you want to protect that resource and hybrid classes can help you do that. And then there's uh, uh, what happens with this compliance business. There are tipping points. If you have relatively low compliance, there's almost no point in doing it. If you're gonna do compliance, you have to do it well. So universities are smart to make physical distancing easier and they have to train students to increase compliance. And it's helpful if students do the training with other students. And finally, uh, there's cost benefit analysis trade-offs. 
this is a testing graph. Just focus on the graph on the left there for a second. That pink line shows various test configurations with different types of priorities, but all costing the same, 4,200 tests per week. That blue line to below it, the aqua line, that's half as many tests. So it's gonna be roughly half as much money. But if you organize testing in the right way, you can get better outcome results. You can get higher on that vertical axis on the aqua line than you do on the pink line. So it's not just the amount of testing that you do, it's the particular way that you test that matters. And in this case, what matters most is making sure that you test more frequently the staff members who face students regularly and clean student areas or work in dining halls and so on. So this is, um, this is the tool. It's uh, still in development, of course. We're calibrating against regularly updated regional and university health data to make it more responsive. But that dashboard I mentioned is on the way. We're disseminating through partners and university networks, and we're looking for open source development partnerships. And we have some of them already. So we can take up more of this in the, in the discussion section. Thank you for your attention. Back to you. Thank you, Wesley. If uh, we can have uh, all our panel members switching their cameras on, that would be great. Um, the objective, and uh, Wesley, if you can start sharing, then we have everyone on their big screen. That should be quite wonderful. Good, thank you. Um, you already learned about me, you learned about Wesley, David, and Gordon. But uh, I have uh, three additional panelists invited today. As I said, we are working on, on a bigger uh, scale within the working group, uh, trying to find out what's going on outside of uh, our uh, limits. And we also have uh, lots of experts that are helping us in addition to those that you already heard. Uh, two of those that uh, directly contributed to the development of the artificial university and are very helpful in adding additional ideas and are adding the necessary professionalism uh, to making this an open source. And um, we are currently working on the last uh, legal hurdles to get the uh, link out. In the moment we have to go, the link will be on the coalition website. Um, was the question, can other universities participate? Absolutely. The idea is uh, for us that we definitely want to provide this tool to universities that need it, in particular to universities that are traditionally underserved and that may not have the endowments and the money to set up a, a nice a group of, of scientists to help them making decisions. Uh, so we are thinking about minority colleges, smaller colleges, as they are the ones who definitely need this kind of support as well. So we have Justin Liam from uh, Simodyne, okay. Uh, he is uh, very well uh, at home in uh, professional software development uh, and the use of modeling and simulation as a decision support tool in a um, domain where normally nobody laughs. It's uh, mainly looking into uh, all businesses and banks. And uh, he was the one who helped us a lot to think about uh, some of the economic impacts. And we also have Ed Powell here. He is uh, a president of TensorX. He has been using modeling and simulation as decision support and to um, make decision makers and, and uh, high level decision makers aware of complexity problems in a lot of different applications. Um, so I'm very happy to have those here, and I'm in particular also happy that uh, Madhav Marathi is here, who is a chief scientist for the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia. And what we are doing with uh, our TAU, the Artificial University, is something that he is very well aware of, not only from his own university, but also from other universities. Uh, plus, he is in charge of one of the biggest artificial societies that I'm aware of, and so we hope to get some insight from him as well. Um, but uh, let me start with Ed. Uh, looking into the artificial university, where do you see the big advantages and the, the dangers to have a tool like how giving out to the administrators to work with it? Well, first of all, 
for us, we see an advantage in just helping uh, organizations think through the problems. Uh, as one begins to model, one begins to think about the problems and, and both kind of unintended consequences, which we think are some of the biggest issues, uh, but also begin to see what the trade-offs are. So begin to have a mindset, not of we're gonna solve a single value optimization problem, but this is a very complex problem where there's all kinds of trade-offs. And in essence, policies don't save one thing, they just make trade-offs. And uh, one, one of the places where we've looked at this actually is in um, testing. We, for example, work with several companies that are in the process of getting approval for their testing platforms around flu and COVID. Uh, and, and by looking at these models, you can see how, what the impact of actually improvements in the very devices means in terms of their operational performance. And, and that actually informs even how you think about product development. So, so we see this as a very agile, nimble, fast cycle, iterative process, where as you build models and then begin to layer in more and more complexity, you're able to see the trade-offs that are actually happening and it makes you think about the problem you're trying to solve. Um, Justin, having applied this in, in your domains, um, what are your lessons learned that you see that are definitely worth sharing, in particular when it comes to collaboration or uh, trying to develop this together in an open source environment? Well, our, I mean, our primary focus at Simudine is about getting stuff moved into a production environment. So you, we're, we're typically dealing with vast amounts of data that's purchased or comes from, you know, different exchanges and, you know, we're operating at incredibly fast time scales, you know, running very large simulations. So, you know, this is a problem where, you know, there's hundreds of, you know, thousands of universities across the United States that are going to need a, a tool where they can explore these trade-offs as Ed talked about and, and, and then sort of understand how different policies might play out in their institution different varying, you know, varying levels of compliance, different acceptability on different types of policies that, that will be palatable and not palatable. So we just, we're really focused on working with Wesley and his team to help you know, productize this and productionize this as quickly as possible in an open source fashion so that you know, the mathematics can be scrutinized, people can extend it for their own, their own purposes. Um, and, and also most importantly, you know, by, you know, by making it open source and making those assumptions really clear, you know, expose any biases and any of those sorts of things that people are worried about and allow them to take control of their own destiny as they use this for their own decision making. So it's really about productionizing this and getting it into a fit for an enterprise level decision making within weeks as opposed to months or because we don't have months and months and months to, to, to sort of build this. Madhav, uh, you are doing this on a way more bigger scale than we ever dreamed about in the uh, working group as uh, everything we did was just on uh, goodwill of the participating partners as the coalition says there's no money changing hands everyone is contributing what we can do so um, you have this, this huge project where you are using uh, agent-based models to help uh, governors to make better decisions so what, what are your lessons learned here regarding the activities? So, yeah, thanks, Andrea. So I think uh, we are developing the kinds of tools you talked about, and I'm happy to send a link to our web page so that people have a sense for it. Um, what, what we are after is to try and build models which are, which sort of respect the essential heterogeneity of the of the social system that we're going to study. So in some ways, Boston would look something different than Washington, D.C., or Washington, D.C. would look some different than Charlottesville. And to the extent possible, we would like to capture it. And as uh, Wesley said, we also want to capture the human behavioral aspects. So we have been building these models to support our sponsors uh, at DOD, at, uh, at the state, um, on a regular basis. Uh, from questions here to projections to counterfactuals. But in the last you know, four or five weeks, the question of what we call enterprise reopening has come up. And uh, I think your talk set, set, sets up well, where we are thinking about helping them to understand how enterprises would reopen, be it university campuses, 
be it uh, you know office buildings, uh, be it uh, government offices for that matter. And what we have started to do in the, in this context at UVA is to build such an artificial sort of UVA and embed it within the Albemarle County context and then study the kinds of questions that Wesley actually described, you know, what's the best way to test, uh, what would happen if you, you know, if you decide to isolate the level of compliance and its impact. Uh, but I think what is important in this particular setting that you asked lessons learned is twofold. There's a process where you use these models of planning and what's, that's what we're doing right now. All my experience in supporting such outbreaks, you know, during we have participated during the H1N1 outbreak, the Ebola outbreak, the Zika outbreak, is that you have to go into a complete different mode when you talk about responding in real time, which is what will happen once the campus is open. So plans are very useful, but almost instantaneously you throw them out and then try to adaptively plan as, as things change. So I think that's something I would like to let the entire uh, group of attendees know that we will build these tools, but we are also very keenly aware that we'll have to adapt these plans as things go along. Um, so I'll stop there in the interest of time and we can we can discuss it further. This will, Andres, I just wanna say like, I noticed some of the questions about compliance and students sort of being non-compliant. And I think that's one of the real benefits about this human simulation effort where, you know, we're taking you know, a realistic understanding of human behavior. And rather than a set of structural equations, top down looking at aggregates, it's really enabling you know, what, what, the, what the team with Wesley's team has done is they've created a model that allows the university to really understand their own unique experience with, with perhaps compliance and, and non-compliance and, and sort of understand what that might mean. So if for whatever reason you have a non-compliant population, then what are some of the other things that you might do to potentially help, um, you know, acknowledging that trade-off? So instead of a one-size-fits-all, it's really allowing that university to make its own determination and sort of explore, and most importantly, look at the sensitivity of it. So say, you know, if, if we have, you know, very low compliance, and, we, and, and that's what we think is happening as we do our surveys and we gather the empirical data about what's actually happening, we're, we're seeing low compliance. What does that mean? What, what could that mean? And do we need to take another policy about maybe, you know, sending people home or something like that? So, I mean, Wesley could talk more about that, but he's actually baked that into his idea. And I think that's why he's taken this idea of, of an agent-based approach, but I'm speaking for you, Wesley. Sorry. So, so. I just like to pick up on that because I think that's so critical. That's why we started our plan with what is literally called the protect Purdue pledge. And it outlines the set of behaviors that we expect students, if they want to remain on campus, to prescribe by. Uh, you know, and we'll throw them off campus if they can't prescribe by this. And I've talked to student after student after student. What's their biggest fear? Staying at home. Right? <laughs> they would rather they would rather be locked in a dorm for the semester uh, than stay at home. Okay. And 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 literally, what we're finding is it's just about coaching and feedback. Uh, small example, we had a group of student leaders that were going to run an event and they were all in their suits and ties. And, you know, this was before we rolled out some things and, and really tried to establish a core set of behaviors. And none of them, they were in a room, literally like sitting two feet from one another. They didn't have masks. And our chief medical officer of our leading hospital in West Lafayette sent me a picture that said, oops, missed opportunity. So what did I do? I sent him a note. I included the message from the chief medical officer. And I said, look, this is a coaching and feedback moment. You guys are tremendous leaders in, the, in this university and we're counting on you to show and lead by example. Here's a note from a, a faculty or a, a chief medical officer for one of our hospitals. Think what this picture could look like if you guys were wearing masks sitting side by side. You know what the student said? Thank you so much for that feedback. We're going to retake that photo. We're all going to be wearing masks and we're going to do the right thing. And they sent the guy a note and they said, thank you for pointing this out to us. This is what kids can do if you ask them to do it, I, I believe. And again, the fear factor is stay at home <laughs> and be with your family or, you know, at least be on campus, but you have to abide by these new behaviors that are quote unquote, the new normal. Uh, it's so, yeah. crit it's so critical, so critical. Yeah, and this ability to simulate how these behaviors are changing and, you know, uh, can really start to give you a sense of how that will unfold with delays over time.
looking at the this is the question of uh, different uh, behavior patterns, different possibilities. Um, I see that the human aspect is going to be one of the biggest deep uncertainties. And uh, what I uh, see, I'm blessed. Both of my uh, kids are out of college. The younger one just graduated in spring and uh, he's now with the, the army. I know the difference between the Boy Scouts and the army is that the Boy Scouts have adult supervision. So maybe I should not be so less stressed, but um, it's, um, and I understand a lot of, a lot of the challenges. Uh, my question as an engineer is, who do I get the data? Where do I get the data from? Because the model is made up out of two things. And we very often are, are looking at the algorithms and of the transformation of input to output parameters. How do we get this data? Maybe Marta, how you do get the data for your big models? So it's a good question. You know, there is no one, one shop where everything works out, right? Uh, so we have over, the, over really multiple years, close to 25 years now, collected or at least identified data sources and they keep changing. Um, for this particular round, um, you can take a look at our website. We have made some data available, uh, but in the process also collected a lot of data sets. Um, I must point out that there's a website that the Midas group that NIGMS funds maintains as a data resource. Um, so no single site, but there are still quite a few data sources available. I think today as, as, a, uh, as computer scientists and data scientists have come a long way where a lot of this data is machine readable. So you can, if you have good people on your side, take advantage of this data. New York Times makes some of them available. So for us, for building out these models, we have taken data from universities, you know, office, for student schedules and times. We have data about census. We have data from about all the locations in our, in our area. We are starting to get data about digital traces. We have data about mobility flows. We have data about uh, travel surveys. So we have to collect all this to, to essentially end up building the artificial society that I mentioned. And that, and that um, website that you've just shared, Mahav, you, know, you have a link to an opinion piece in the preceding national academies of science and that opinion piece is really useful because sometimes people can say well we know what we need to do we just need to put the mask on or we need to maintain social distancing we use it you need to use these npis and so forth why do we need to use modeling simulation and you articulate you know three solid reasons why your modeling simulation in the middle of the epidemic you know, of a pandemic is very helpful you know not least of which is being able to really quantify you know, the different effects of your mitigation efforts, which is really powerful for parents. It's really powerful for the students. It's, it's, it's powerful when you're having conversations with, with your alumni and, and the faculty. So being able to quantify the likely effect of your mitigation efforts, that's one of the key ones. It is also being able to provide guidance on the scale of the innovation, interventions required to truly achieve containment, really being able to give people some hard numbers on the scale of compliance, for example, that's required. And, you know, and also being able to really crystallize the different factors that will fundamentally change the, the course and influence the course of the outbreak. So those are things that your paper identified in your opinion piece. And I think that really resonates for me personally, you know, why this sort of artificial university can be really powerful because, you know, this can be quite contentious. Lots of people get into almost sort of like philosophical, you know, quasi-religious debates about yes, no, and liberty versus compliance. And all, you, know, you get into this really you know, and a simulation can help sort of take the hot air out of those debates and ground it in science. Yeah, I think you make a really the golden good. angel, the golden angel of timekeeping is popping up here on my screen. Uh, I, I would like to give uh, Wesley uh, one little chance, as uh, I know that uh, we did some evaluation of uh, what it means to be compliant or not compliant, and, and how this affects uh, most of the results, just to to show you the power of having a, a computational tool to think about problems here. And uh, while Wesley is preparing this, um, we are in absolutely uh, on the way to post the uh, open source code very, very soon. I just wait for the last uh, kick from our administration that we are allowed to do so. We are waiting for one more input and then it's going to be available. Wesley, and you have to unmute, you are still. 
sorry. Yeah, good. So that's uh, the, the tower includes about six different types of compliance to try and deal with the fact that this problem isn't just a one size fits all students problem. And there's uh, compliance related to whether or not you're going to report symptoms to a tracing app. There's compliance related to whether or not you're going to wear a mask and do physical distancing. There's compliance if you're in quarantine or self-isolation, are you actually going to do it? And there's a whole bunch of things. So that they're measured separately and operate separately in the simulation. But here's a very important consideration for all of us is that there are equity issues here as well. We're hearing from some universities that an equity measure is really critical for them. So uh, um, the next version has race and socioeconomic status built into the agents. And we've got the socio sociological work done so that we understand how that affects students. In particular, uh, students of uh, low socioeconomic status tend to live at home and commute to campus. And students of racial minorities tend to be low socioeconomic status. They tend to live in multi-generational communities and homes. So the, the infection of people who are vulnerable is much more likely for those students than it is for other students. Um, so th these sorts of considerations, again, are human factors and we're building them into the next version of this so that schools for whom that's an issue can have a relevant metric to allow themselves to see what the effect of the intervention is in terms of those metrics. Yeah, I, I see that it's already 326, so we definitely have to start to roll up. Uh, as always, I was only able to get a fraction of uh, the questions out. Uh, I apologize to everyone uh, who is still burning to give answers. Um, I also have to admit that it's definitely worthwhile to have a look into the chat because there was a complete parallel site discussion with a lot of very, very interesting points going on there. So I uh, hope that we will be able to uh, save some of those as well as uh, there are a couple of very nice examples that I definitely can interconnect with. So ethics. And you follow Wesley's example by talking to us being muted. Oh, thanks. Um, I do have one more question for the group and that's just uh, re related to contact tracing. And uh, how do you quantify the effectiveness of a contact tracing program, or how does that data feed into a model, for example, and maybe uh, understand what, uh, what Purdue's planning on doing for their contact tracing? We uh, have, we're using access uh, or proximity to the Wi-Fi access points on campus. So we can track when somebody's on the quote unquote Wi-Fi, obviously it's never, no system's perfect. But we know that students in classrooms and dorms and dining halls and common spaces, they're you know, on their cell phones or computers accessing, uh, um, accessing the internet through the campus Wi-Fi. So we can track down to about 20 feet of resolution, not six feet, but you know, 20 feet. And we can look paired, and I, it's, I take me too long to pull it up, but what's very interesting is we went back to pre-COVID in February and we tracked a couple students that we knew and just kind of said, okay, if we were to associate risk with your roommate, the people you dined with, the uh, people that you spend the most time in the classroom with, not just in the classroom, but literally like your lab partner and that kind of thing. Um, and then sort of your study circle, um, the groups of people that you spent, again, most, most time with outside the classroom. If you just took those four things, you captured probably about eight to 10 people. I mean, most kids on campus are that way. And we're not even going to wait to test, or we're not even going to wait to contact trace. <laughs> you know, when they report symptoms and they say, hey, I'm not feeling well, we are going to pull the trigger almost immediately on testing those four or five um, individuals. Uh, you know, the other one is girlfriend, boyfriend. You know, that, that, that's another one. Uh, that, one you can, that one's hard to pick up. So that's, that's a question you basically have to ask when they call in to report symptoms. But we think that if we can rapidly test this in 24 hours, that small so, you know, group of people, uh, then we can really do a lot to mitigate the risk. Uh, and we obviously then have to be very diligent about uh, isolation of people that test positive and then have symptoms, and then uh, quarantine those that uh, don't test positive but need to be then monitored for that pre-symptomatic sort of state. And we're also talking about serial testing people um, because of the point in time nature of testing. So that's one strategy associated with our testing program and uh, contact tracing. 
this is uh, and the nice thing with Tau is that we are looking into very similar social networks, and these are all additional social networks, like people I go to class with, I go to a party with, I uh, meet at a sport event, I go to the uh, Mensa with, and so on. And uh, now that gives us the opportunity, as we have these nets available, to apply net algorithms that are uh, combining and calculating the most influential points in these many nets. And those are the ones that we recommend to observe, test, and vaccinate. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Andreas, for unlocking this world that you've helped to develop. And uh, I wish everyone on the panel uh, best, of, uh, best of luck and, and uh, continued uh, success with your work. We, we're really going to be relying on you. Uh, it's impressive how much this is a human factors phenomena and the transparency that's going to be needed between students and faculty in particular. So uh, we look forward to maybe to having you back in a few more weeks and seeing uh, what, what success uh, and what we've learned uh, from then. Well, we will be meeting every week, uh, every Wednesday, 2.30 to 3.30 for our, our uh, sessions. Uh, next week, we'll be also on the topic of uh, returning to office and uh, some other aspects of the behavioral components of successful back to office. So thank you again and uh, stay safe. Thank Thanks you for having us. Take thank care. You.